We're now heading into the war's long period of stalemate, the four-year interlude between Hideyoshi's first and second Korean invasions. It's going to be a time of mutual misunderstanding by both the Japanese and the Chinese as they try to reach a settlement. The Koreans, meanwhile, the pawn in the middle, they're not being listened to at all. And then comes more violence. The Japanese are going to make a show of their power. All that's coming up. As always, before we roll, please support my channel by hitting the subscribe and like buttons. Like that. Let's begin with an update on Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Since the start of the war, he'd been overseeing the invasion from his headquarters at Nagoya, on the north coast of Kyushu, near what is the city of Fukuoka today. His plan was to cross over to Korea once his armies had reached the north, and to personally lead the advance into China. Then, in late August, 1592, Hideyoshi receives word that his mother is sick. He hurries off to Osaka, but he's too late. She dies before he arrives. Hideyoshi remains in the vicinity of Osaka and Kyoto for several months after that, months in which the Korean invasion grinds to a halt. When he finally returns to invasion headquarters later in the year, his plans have changed. Previously, Hideyoshi had said he would retire to the port of Ningpo after conquering China, an ideally situated spot on the Chinese coast for overseeing his new empire and affairs back in Japan. That plan is now cancelled. While he's been away, Hideyoshi has ordered the construction begun on a retirement residence for himself in Kyoto instead a castle called Fushimi. He continues to talk about going to Korea and leading the march into China, but that doesn't last, not after his armies start pulling back to the south. Even then, though, Hideyoshi doesn't acknowledge this as a setback. It's a victory! His armies are withdrawing because they've achieved their objective. China has been beaten! At this very moment, China is sending envoys to Japan to apologize to Hideyoshi and receive his demands. This is how Hideyoshi is portraying events in Korea in 1593. Does he actually believe it? Partly no, partly yes. Hideyoshi knows that the Korean situation is not good. He's read the reports. He can't afford to acknowledge this, however, because it would make him look weak to his rivals in Japan. If powerful daimyo like Tokugawa Ieyasu smell weakness, they might rise up against Hideyoshi and try to seize the country. So Hideyoshi has to appear strong. At the same time, however, Hideyoshi is receiving misleading reports from Konishi Yukinaga in Korea that the Chinese are willing to offer major concessions. So even after his armies have pulled back to the south coast of Korea, Hideyoshi is expecting a favorable outcome. There's one more factor about Hideyoshi that we need to consider. His preoccupation. By the middle of 1593, he no longer seems to be devoting himself fully to his campaign overseas in Korea. He's spending vast amounts of time instead on memorizing no plays and perfecting his skill as an actor, on tea ceremonies and poetry, and on entertainments like a costume party where he dresses up like a street vendor and wanders among the guests shouting, Melons! Melons! Get your nice fresh melons! Is Hideyoshi just eccentric? Or is he becoming mentally unbalanced? And then there would be something else. 
one of Hideyoshi's concubines, Yodogimi, is pregnant. She would give birth in September 1593 to a son named Hideyori. Hideyoshi's only other son, Tsurumatsu, had died in infancy in 1591, and Hideyoshi had more or less given up on ever having a natural-born son. So Yorogimi's unexpected pregnancy, and then the birth of a son, Hideyori, will be a source of great joy for Hideyoshi, and yet another source of preoccupation. The two Ming envoys, accompanied by Kunishi Yukinaga, arrived at Nagoya on June 14, 1593. They sat down for formal talks with Kunishi and a gathering of daimyo a few days later. In fact, there was no talking. The only way for the two sides to communicate was in writing. A monk named Genso, who was an expert in written Chinese, served as scribe for the Japanese side. When asked by the Chinese why Japan had started the war, Genso, interpreting for Konishi, replied that Hideyoshi had merely wanted to be accepted by the Emperor of China as a vassal. The Koreans had refused to assist him, so he had sent his army to convey his appeal directly to Beijing. The Koreans had tried to stop his army and had begun the war. It was therefore all their fault. The Chinese envoys knew this wasn't true. They were there to quiet down the Japanese, however, so they just nodded their heads. Now, we need to pause here and ask ourselves, why did Konishi tell the Chinese that Hideyoshi wanted to be recognized as a vassal of China, when Hideyoshi in reality wanted China to be a vassal to him? Okay, first, remember that Hideyoshi is an ultimate dictator. When you serve a man like that, your fundamental goal is to keep him happy. That's what Konishi is trying to do here, keep Hideyoshi happy. Would communicating Hideyoshi's true wishes to the Chinese achieve this purpose? No, that would have offended the Chinese and they would have stormed out, which would have upset Hideyoshi. So Konishi instead is playing a game. He's trying to get something out of the Chinese that he can present to Hideyoshi as a concession, a win. And it works. Hideyoshi, who can't read Chinese to verify what actually took place in the meeting, is led by Konishi to believe that China is ready to cater to his demands. And this makes him happy. For the next month, he treats the Ming envoys to no plays and tea ceremonies and banquets at Nagoya, displaying his generosity, his refinement and power. Hideyoshi's intention is to impress, but he goes too far. For example, sitting godlike atop a high platform at banquets so that the Ming envoys have to look way up. In their eyes, this is uncivilized, boorish behavior. It's how a barbarian chieftain would act. Okay, let's head back to Korea. The Japanese army is encamped in a string of forts on the southeast coast around Pusan, and a number of its commanders, men like Kato Kiyomasa and Kobuyakawa Takakage, they're in a bloody mood. The retreat south has been a humiliation for them, and they now want revenge to save face. They have their eye on the city of Chinju to the west, it had been attacked the previous year with heavy losses, but had never been taken. And it now remains an enemy stronghold, uncomfortably close to the Japanese lines. A letter is therefore sent to Nagoya asking for Hideyoshi's permission to strike it. This seems like a good idea to Hideyoshi, a way to punish the stubborn Koreans, and at the same time remind China that he is still a power to be reckoned with. He therefore agrees. Kunishi Yukinaga tries to dissuade Kato when he hears of the plan. He fears it will upset negotiations with the Chinese. But it's no good. 
Nothing can stop what's coming. Kunishi therefore passes word to Chinese representative Shen Wei Jing in Pusan, and Shen in turn warns the Koreans to clear out. Some, like guerrilla leader Kwak jae the Red Coat General, he leaves Chinju. He's not going to sacrifice his men in what he sees as a hopeless fight. Others pour into the city. Among them are Wee Byung leader Kim Chon il with 300 volunteers, army commander Huang Jin with 700 government troops, and 400 men under Ko Chong Hu, son of Ko Kyung Myung, who had been killed the previous year at Kumsan. The defenders massing inside Chinju total between three and four thousand, about the same number that withstood the Japanese attack the previous year. This time, however, they're not facing an army of just fifteen thousand, daunting enough. Almost the entire might of the Japanese army is coming. Ninety-three thousand men, killing and burning and looting as they go, and driving terrified civilians before them. By the time the gates of Chinju are closed, tens of thousands of these civilians have joined the defenders inside. The Japanese lay siege to Chinju on June 20th, 1593. For seven days, they attacked the walls and worked to undermine the fortifications. Finally, on June 27th, they broke through into the city. The mass of civilians inside were thrown into a panic. As they raced about, looking for a way to escape, commanders Kim Chon il Ko Chong Hu, and others fell back to the south wall overlooking the Nam River. They turned north and with tears streaming down their faces bowed in the direction of Seoul and their king. Then they joined hands and threw themselves into the river. The orgy of destruction that followed at Chinju was the worst atrocity the Japanese would commit in the war. 60,000 Koreans, mostly civilians, were slaughtered. The walls were pulled down. All the buildings were burned. When the Japanese were done, Chinju had ceased to exist. After the destruction of Chinju, a number of Japanese commanders held a banquet in the pavilion where Kim Chon il and the others had jumped into the Nam River. A young Korean woman named Non Ge appeared on the rocks below the pavilion and beckoned seductively to them to come down. One of the commanders from Kato Kiyomasa's contingent drunkenly climbed over the railing and down onto the rocks. He went to Non Ge and she welcomed him into her arms. Then she seized him tight and jumped into the river, dragging them both down to the bottom where they drowned. <laughs>